Okay, so today I wanted to quickly go over um, what's inside a basic desktop computer. This video is not for someone who has probably built their own computer and knows um, all the ins and outs of customization. It's not for someone who has maybe designed quite a bit of components or even knows what PCB is. It's for more for people who have maybe never looked inside their computer, considering upgrading. Um, it's for novice electrical engineers who have never taken a computer part, and believe me, it's not as rare as one would seem. I've met quite a bit of engineers who have um, never really taken one apart, never actually replaced a system board, never even put in uh, an upgrade card for a PCI, uh, which does surprise me a bit. And even though these desktop computers, um, you know, uh, are not around as much, they're not as ubiquitous as they used to be, with phones and laptops replacing those, and as well as tablets they become instructive because the lessons from these desktops and the ways and the architecture that these are designed and the means to get information in and out are still well applicable. This is an IBM desktop that uh, Lenovo was bought and as you see you see your basic ports video output serial keyboard LPT25 you see the power supply there at the very corner uh, for the power you see some expansion ports that are possible in the front there is the um, you know, there's the CD-ROM, um, some USB, audio, mic, and name. So nothing, nothing terribly fancy here. So let's take a look inside now and discover what's in there. Okay, so let's open this up. Now this one's kind of nice. It has a clamshell type approach, so you can just uh, open it up like that for easy um, accessibility to uh, everything. It has your hard drive. It has your processor here with a fan. Um, aluminum fan grill to um, switch the heat away from the processor. Uh, fan guard, here's a standard uh, your fan, I'm not sure. Um, over here we have the CD-ROM, which I think this one just swings open to access like that. Um, we have the standard power supply or the PSU and um, that's basically it from the onset of what you normally would see. So let's take apart uh, some of this. So. Look, most of this stuff is e uh, easily upgradable or um, there we go so this is a standard hard drive so this particular mod is a 250 gig uh, Barracuda hard drive and uh, the connectors on this one are um, your standard connections that you would see today you have your power and you have your SATA this is for customizing whether it's master or slave hardly used these days since most uh, hard drives just have, uh, most computers just have one drive. And then you have this kind of plastic apparatus that uh, Lenovo put on there that allows for it to be easily uh, removable just to save time in their repair shop. Um, so nothing nothing fancy here. This is where all your data of the operating system are stored. If, if it crashes, that's the device that crashes. This is the standard CD-ROM that you would see or that you may, for example, upgrade if you want to add uh, DVD player or CD-ROM just slides forward so very easy to access um, again almost the same type of connections you would expect so we have have the power supply and we have the SATA connection here uh, just pull that off squeeze and pull this one just comes right out and this one somehow should be easily removable I'm not sure um, let's take a look here so there's just a latch on the side and that comes straight out so I've removed the CD-ROM drive, and um, at the bottom side of this, you can actually see a small speaker. This is just showing that it's 8 ohm at 1 watt max. We have this big, fancy fan. We have the shroud over it to um, take and wick the heat from these aluminum fins, and the airflow would go from the processor, or actually from the back of the, of the uh, unit here, through the processor, and out into the front. Um, commonly you'll see where good computer um, designs where well, they'll take these small wires, sometimes they have these bigger fat ribbons and they'll um, zip tie these like they've done here or use plastic ties and the reason why that is just to keep airflow uh, from being blocked. So some of these ribbons may be this would come over here and it blocks uh, the airflow. So at any rate, let's go ahead and let's take this fan off. Every computer in manufacturing have their own way of latching and unlatching these uh, different type of uh, fans and heat sinks. So some of them are pretty fancy, some of them uh, 
clearly are not. Some of them just screw and unscrew right in. So again, here's the fan, and let me undo this pile here. Okay, so okay, so with this heat sink um, apparatus, we have a standard fan. As you can see, it's a pretty good sized fan. I mean, it's a, your standard 12 volt fan. Um, this is the heat sink that wicks away heat from the processor onto these fins here, and then the airflow comes right through here and cools it off. Um, these are four connections, and what you're looking at is because you're probably thinking, hey, a fan should only have two. Why, why does this have four wires? Well, I don't know quite the color scheme that this particular manufacturer may use, but we can probably guess. So this is ground right here. Uh, this yellow one is probably the plus 12 volt. The red or the... Um, green one is probably the plus 5 volt because you can have the fan as it turns on vary between a high speed and low speed or 12 volt and 5 volt. This would be if your processor is just overheating you may want to um, increase the fan speed on that and finally this blue one is either a temperature sensor or an RPM sensor. My guess is it's probably a temperature sensor so there's a thermistor built on the fan that can help measure or that can aid in measuring the temperature of the air coming through these fins and that would then indicate whether the fan needs to spin at high speed or low speed. You can generally tell if there's a thermistor somewhere around here that's measuring the temperature. If you take apart the fan and you look on the back side you would undoubtedly see a thermistor which looks like a small little bead um, attached to a resistor. So this is the processor just processes the data that's coming in from the uh, hard drive, the data from the um, RAM. Um, in phones, they have this. In phones, they may call it like Samsung has a Snapdragon. Apple, they've got the, called the A6 or the A5. Uh, processors are known by, um, you know, the brains or uh, Intel makes them, AMD makes them as well. They're basically what, when someone wants a faster computer, that's the first thing that they'll either upgrade or switch the whole computer itself because you can't put just any good old processor in this. It takes only a special kind or special variety. Um, so this right here, I think this is uh, the latest Pentium 4, judging by uh, the fact that there are no pins on the back side. Uh, remove some of this uh, heat thermal paste. This is this thermal paste, by the way, is important. It, if you put metal on metal, the transition from the heat from the processor onto this fan right here may not be as good and then because there are small voids in between the metal you know microscopic or you can even see here where the scratches right so in between those scratches are valleys and heat doesn't transfer well between air and so you use thermal paste to fill those voids and to help transition the heat from the processor to the fins where it can be cooled off that's why this thermal paste is important and um, so as I said, it's not a very fancy processor, what we would consider these days. It just says um, Intel, it's a E5400 Pentium. So this is a dual core, not a Pentium 4. So you got a dual core, it was manufactured in Costa Rica. It's a 2.7 gigahertz, two megabyte of L2 cache. Uh, it was made in 2006 and its front side bus speed is 800 uh, megahertz. And it's got uh, its own serial number, it's got model number here, a fancy barcode, and then just uh, these are all on the bottom here, these are all actually contacts. I think there's 200 some. The processors these days will have more. Um, so that's the brains. So when you pay a lot for a computer, that's basically what you're paying for. So this is the back end of the processor, when the, what it sits on, and those are just pins that are uh, basically spring-loaded, and uh, they ride on the back side, and you can hear it when I press down, but they're just coming right back up. Power supply unit. This is what gives uh, 12 volt uh, in the form of the yellow. We have the ground, which is black. Uh, we have what I believe is 5 volt in the red. Um, I could be incorrect, but that's generally the standard format. And we have orange. I believe orange may actually be 3.3 volt or 3.5 volt. Power supply if you have additional expansion ports that are absolutely required. Um, they may require more power, but otherwise the power supply just normally easily replaceable. This is the main 24-pin connector that goes to the system board, and um, 
Again, you may have special voltages that are predicated on the specific use of it or the uh, specific company that made it or the brand. Um, so again, different voltage, different colors represent uh, those specific voltages. Nothing that you can edit or really change on this. It's pretty fixed. Um, the next thing that we have is the memory. And one of the most upgraded features of a desktop or um, a laptop that you can um, really do um, cheaply. The performance is usually pretty good if, um, if you have very little memory and there's nothing much to it. It's just standard chips that allow more documents and data to be stored in since the data rate on this is much much higher. This is a standard 1 gig stick uh, DDR PC2 6400. So that just stands for the speed and for the spec that it is. This one here is a different style although it does the exact same thing. This is also a 1 gig by Kingston and if you take a look right here so as I said, there's different voltages for different units. And you can see here, this specific memory requires a 1.8 volt. Oh, that's why that power supply unit may actually have more voltage, um, <clears throat> more wires and different colors. So navigating around the board, quickly we have the processor. Here's where the fan goes. Again, this is the memory. We have uh, the expansion ports on the back that we saw. This is where you connect the USB, the keyboard, the mouse, the printer. Um, one of the things that we haven't really covered up is the expansion ports and right here and uh, what you're looking at here are different ways in which you can add features so if you want to add a sound card or perhaps a new video card these are where they, you would add the Mac as we saw the hard drive and the CD-ROM they were connected to the standard SATA connectors so that's what we were looking at there so, so these are serial ATA SATA connectors this is what the CD-ROM and the hard drive were connected to um, as you can see this white connector that went to the power supply unit navigating around uh, those two orange connectors right there are for adding additional USB ports in the front of most computers you have that option but if you wanted to customize or add more ports you would simply just drag a wire from the front run it on the side here and plug it into here if we go further around the perimeter of this board the next thing that you're going to probably identify with. So this is the Petzo electric speaker. This beeps if the computer completes its post. This one is to refer if you have issues with um, the computer it may beep once or twice indicating a post error, a memory error, a power error. This is what's truly really making that beep 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 error. Um, this again is for the expansion of memory. Uh, only two slots here and normally you can put only so much RAM, so you can only put maybe two gigs on each side for a maximum of four. Additional power here, depending on whether your computer um, actually requires it or not. And these are really indicator lights. So if you see your hard drive blinking on and off, uh, to connect your power so you can turn it off, um, there may be a power LED here, there may be one for sound, uh, or you may have additional switches. This, this is what these options go to. So on the front, when you click on power, that wire connects back here and then it short circuits that temporarily and that tells the computer to turn on. Probably one of the most overlooked aspects of uh, most computers is actually the battery. It's called a CMOS battery or the complementary metal oxide battery. And its purpose is to let the computer um, keep track of the time. It also keeps tracks of specific settings such as voltage or power for your um, processor if it's been customized. So um, in the advent you continuously turn on your computer and the time seems to be reset to 12 o'clock at 1984 or something like that. that. This is what would need to be changed. It's just a standard battery and in fact for some of you that have very large watches you may recognize this because it can take the exact same battery. It is almost universal this battery. You see it uh, just about everywhere and um, almost all electronics. So when I was referring to it, some of the technology or some of the devices are maintained, I see this type of battery in um, almost all units that are large or that require um, information to be retained. So, and what is this chip right here for? I mean, you have a processor. Why do you need two more large chip? So the processor is in charge of processing data. It's easily upgradable and you would think that that's all you would need. Everything else are just connections, but not quite true. You also need something to manage the speeds for the video. 
or your audio, any extension that you put in there. You need something to manage the communication between these two and the speed. You don't want the processor dealing with these slow types of communication when, or when it could be dealing with millions of calculations per second. These are on the hundreds or the thousands. You really don't want the processor to be bogged down by trying to manage this. Even for a couple of milliseconds, it's far too long. You also don't want it to be bogged down by managing the USB, which is far, far slower, or the hard drive speed, much less the, serial or the parallel port. So what they have, uh, engineers have done for a considerable amount of time is added what's called a north side bus chip and the south side bus, being from this is the north or the top side, this is the south or the bottom side. This bottom side here basically manages the slower type of communications that you may connect. So the USB, the audio, any type of expansion. The high speed bus or the north bus architecture, this may manage, for example, the communication between the memory. It may manage the um, USB 3.0 that's currently coming out on newer system boards. So that's why generally you see that the processor has a big heat sink. The next one that has a much smaller heat sink is the north side bus. It does get very warm, and as you see, it's right up against where the grill would be for the fan to cool this off. But the south side bus, even though it gets hot, it, not nearly enough to uh, warrant having a cooler on here. So, that, so that's quickly a basic tour. Um, you've probably, if you're an, if you're an electrical engineer, you've probably seen um, these capacitors on here. Um, some of these are for conditioning the power. You generally find quite a few capacitors, actually right around the perimeter of the processor and these are used to condition the power these are inductors and as you see they're um, they're dipped and uh, surrounded in epoxy so that way they don't move because as you may know that if you move the inductor you move the inductance and you change it and that could be an issue where the processor requires very 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 specific tolerances to do its job the right way uh, you have some standard power amps and op amps over here um, as well as a little bit of chips here and there. You may see around the board some smaller chips. Um, if the system board has built-in functions like audio, that audio uh, has to be managed. Uh, so when you hook up a speaker or a microphone, this chip right here is managing that and then communicating that prior to the south side bus, since it's a much slower bus. And then from there it may go to the processor once that's managed as well. As stated earlier, I'm just going over quickly of what's inside a standard desktop computer. And although they're becoming more and more obsolete and their sales are down, the technology that we see in, in these desktop computers still prevails. We still see RAM, right? We hear about memory upgrades all the time on phones or you have to spend more to get more, um, for example, space in the hard drive. You hear about um, a tablet being faster. That's the processor. That's what they're upgrading. or That's what they're um, introducing as a new feature. In addition to that, you can see quickly how large this computer is. You can pretty easily imagine yeah, if you merge some of these chips together, you would save a considerable amount of room and reduce heat in the process. So that's kind of where tablets come into form. Um, sadly though, with these new phones and tablets, it's very difficult to really repair anything on it. One chip can control 90% of everything that happens on the system board and that chip may have 500 pins soldered onto the actual board and um, you can't even, you really can't do much. It's kind of like, um, so there's very difficult to repair. Um, a good example would be auto mechanics where back in the day you could sit outside um, on your driveway and work on your automobile all day long. Nowadays, you can't do that practically without having a computer next to you because everything's automated, everything's much more complicated. If you are an electrical engineer and you have really never taken one of these computers apart before, I encourage you to go do it. Um, go find one. Um, you can normally find some cheap ones. It doesn't really matter the age. And just learn a little bit, up, and just learn a little bit about it. It gives you some hands-on practice. Many, many engineers that I have seen have a tough time handling a screwdriver. And I think someone who takes one of these apart, takes everything out, puts it back in, and really just starts to learn, not only may be more interested in their respective discipline, but will gain that hands-on experience. So if you're going for an interview or if you want to try something different, it gives you an idea of what you're really good at.